Welcome to Dark Window. I'm your host, Jim Mann. Here on this program, I will be talking with many of the leading investigators, researchers, and authors on the topics of UFOs, UAPs, alien abductions, extraterrestrials, and a host of many other fascinating and related topics. So please join me and my guest for the next hour as we reach out. This is Dark Window on KGRA Digital Broadcasting. And with that, hello, everyone, and welcome to Dark Window. I am your host, Jim Mann, and for the next hour, we're going to be talking to a very special guest, Alejandro Rojas. I have known Alejandro for about 15 years. I consider him a friend, and he is one of the most plugged-in UFO people that I know, and I'm proud to have him on my program. Now, Alejandro is the head of research and content at Enigma Labs, a data research and community platform dedicated to unidentified aerial phenomena. He is also a founding board member and director of public relations for the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies, SCU. Alejandro has been a freelance journalist focused on science, space, sci-fi, and UFOs. He maintains the website Open Minds TV, but you can also find his articles in the Huffington Post. Den of Geek, and the Roswell Daily Record, among other news medias, or outlets, I should say. Alejandro is considered an expert on the topic of UAPs. You will see Alejandro in interviews with the media, organizational, other organizations worldwide, including Political, Politico, the BBC, NBC, Fox, Coast to Coast AM, the Travel Channel, Sci-Fi Channel, National Geographic, and E, which is entertainment television. And Alejandro, welcome. And how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, it's great to have you. You know, we're kind of excited about this. You are, you are actually officially our third uh, guest for broadcast. And I know everybody at KGRA as well as us are kind of excited to see what you have to say. Because well, cool. you are the plugged in person. Yeah, well, I'm happy to be on the show and be one of your first guests. I think, you know, I was excited when you said you were going to have a podcast because uh, a lot popping up, but you're someone who, um, you know, has spent years in yeah. this field. Um, so I think that your voice is an important one to have out there. So I'm happy that you're doing this. Well, you know, I'm trying to hang in there and trying to keep pace with everything. And um, good golly, you know, what <laughs> you and I have seen just in the last 15 or 20 years how far we've come with this whole business of UFOs right. and UAPs. It's incredible. And right. you're, we're going to talk about some of that tonight. Uh, let me ask you a question. And I know you kind of know this. Uh, is the government serious about finding answers this time? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really tough one to answer right now. Um, and here are the signals. Here's why. Um Congress seems very motivated to get some research done. Um, Partially, no doubt, because they've had these um, kind of closed door meetings, uh, briefings lately. And I don't think any politician has come out of those briefings not thinking that the topic is serious and it needs more uh, study. So they're certainly motivated, but, you know, they're politicians as well. So I think that how long will that motivation last? Um, I think what uh, people wonder, and, you know, there was a lot of talk about this even when Hillary was was running for president because John Podesta, her campaign manager, was so into this topic. Is, And I think he felt there's a UFO vote out there. And is there? I don't know. I think at that time, it wasn't for sure. I don't think her campaign was sold completely on that, even though John Podesta was. Prior to that, we had um, Dennis Kucinich, uh, you know, had a sighting that came out in Shirley McLean's book. Um, he was asked about that at a presidential debate and it kind of sunk his whole campaign when he said, yeah, I saw something. I don't know what it was. Mm-hmm. And then it actually went to Obama and he made kind of a, a little bit of a joke. He just said, you know, I'm focused on things that are, are more earthly or something like that. And everybody chuckled. So, um, and that ended his campaign at that time. So it wasn't seen that there was a UFO vote, but I think that they, they feel there is now. And I think that they should have probably uh, felt there was one because they're uh, the polls 
you know, mm-hmm. show that uh, there is even a new YouGov poll out today, I believe. People can go, oh, look, I got my Twitter right there. People can go to my Twitter and I tweeted mm-hmm. it. But uh, it showed that, you know, more than 50 percent people out there believe in this topic. So um, that there's something to this. And I think the poll even said more than 50 percent believe that UFOs were aliens. So um, there's a lot of people out there. There probably is a vote for it. And I think this is also the Democrat, uh, the Democrats, you know, trying to get some of the Trump voters a little bit, some of the more um, conspiratorial or fringe type of voters. So. I, I, there's that aspect going on, but they're certainly very motivated. So then we get to the DOD. They're the Pentagon. They're the ones who are supposed to do something about this. Are they motivated? That's the tough one to answer. And I think that they haven't been um, recently. You know, all of this came about when in 2017, in December, as we know, when the New York Times mm-hmm. uh, revealed that the Pentagon had a UAP project. We actually found out about that a couple months before in October, uh, like it is now, when Lou Elizondo had come out and said he was going to work with Tom DeLong with To the Stars, and he said, I'm a guy who used to work on the, with the Pentagon investigating UAP, and a lot of us are like, what are you talking about, Pentagon? And they've been denying that they have had that any interest in the shock. topic since 1969, Many. exactly. Yeah. It was a shock. So, um, you know, he came out in the, in the New York Times article Politico wrote one as well, and it became, you know, this huge deal. But that was a lot of people, and I think um, the Politico author, Brian Bender, made a good point. He was like, this wasn't something the Pentagon asked for. It was something that was thrust upon them by Harry Reid in particular, and a couple of other legislators who wanted to put funding into investigating this sort of thing. Um, at the time, you know, this was the Advanced Aerospace Weapons System Application Program, OSAP, yeah. which was looking at Skinwalker and a bunch of paranormal. Eventually, they kind of tapered that down into a project called the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, which Elizondo A-tip. ran. That was focused, yep, ATIP, that was just focused on military UFO sightings. Um and and so that was happening. And the people that were working on the inside on this were, of course, very excited about the topic. We've all heard from Lou Elizondo now. He's obviously very excited about the topic and motivated you, about the topic. Excuse me. Are you still working with Lou? I'm not. Um, he, Lou is now, and and this was not publicly known until recently, or at least acknowledged. Mm-hmm. He's working with the space, the space commands slash space force because they're kind of all mixed together i think it's technically space force but he's working with space force and usually uh assumingly on on uap topics i guess i can't say that for sure but that's what it sounds like he's doing which is of course very interesting that shows there's some interest there but you know um and i guess getting into that you know um lou worked with osap and atip and You know, it was famously Robert Bigelow, who was um, in his Bigelow Aerospace company that was uh, contracted to run this OSAP program for a while. Jay Stranton, that's his name. um, He eventually, after Lou had retired and left, became head of the UAP task force. That was the first kind of DOD led modern UAP project and it was headed by the navy um that's significant because soon after that new york times article came out uh you know everybody was really excited about the case that they covered the 2004 nimitz uh incident where the giant 40-foot tiktok was seen or tic tac shaped objects jets chased it there's kind of a cat and mouse we've heard from the pilots we've heard from a lot of the witnesses um and the navy you know after a couple years later came out and said we take them seriously. You know, we're back in our guys. They say they saw a UAP. They saw a UAP. We believe that was a UAP. We take UAP seriously. Um, and that was a big moment um, because that was finally the government coming out and saying, we do take this seriously. Um, and it was the Navy. That actually was a big deal because the guy working with um, Lou Elizondo to get all this information out was Chris Mellon. Um, Chris right, Mellon that's... used to work. For um, Congress, uh, as a deputy director of intelligence, um, you know, he would essentially brief them on uh, on black projects, 
uh, and the sort of thing. And he went to his colleagues and said, hey, we're, you guys haven't been briefed on this UAP stuff, have you? And they're like, no. And he's like, well, now that they've admitted they take it seriously and they've done some investigation, don't you think you should? And they were like, yeah. And so, you know, that's yeah. when we started having Congress getting involved and saying, we want to know more. That's when these Nimitz people and other Navy and intelligence people um, were then briefing Congress. We saw this on the History Channel show, uh, Un Unidentified, which starred Chris Mellon and Tom DeLonge mm -hmm. and, and, and Lou Elizondo, where they were doing these briefings. And those briefings were obviously very significant. I don't think there's been one lawmaker who's come out of a briefing not saying that this is a very important topic that we need to take seriously now so christopher, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry christopher mellon goes all the way back to the uh clinton administration right correct? he yes. worked in the clinton administration bush administration um yeah he's been a big deal uh in washington dc for a long time and the mellon is from the mellon family i mean the famous yeah. you know uh, the Mellons, Mellon Banking. So, yeah, he's definitely a plugged in and super influential person, very into this topic. And I think a lot of the, the guiding of um, the government on this topic has been coming from him. He's definitely been a big advisor for a lot of insiders. And I think that's to the benefit of a lot of us who are interested in this topic because he's extremely intelligent and he's really um, holding their feet to the fire. Um, so we saw this Navy group pop up. Uh, then we saw another group pop up under intelligence, uh, more under like defense intelligence. Um, the, the thing was, though, that they, they some of their messaging coming from the DOD, John Kirby in particular, who was a spokesperson, was saying, you know, we're going to look into cases. We've got the Navy collecting cases. We're going to investigate these and we're going to figure some stuff out. Well, the Congress wasn't really happy with that at the time because by then they had already been asking in legislation, putting into their bill, the Defense um, Authorization um, Act, that uh, they wanted UAP research to be done. But what they were calling for was not just starting UAP research ground up. They were like, hey, we had decades of UAP research going on. We had three projects. We had Sign, Grudge, Blue Book, maybe Blue Book. others. Um, you need to look at that data as well and work with civilians who have been collecting information even since then. So there's an abundance of information out there that you can use to start to analyze and figure things out now. You need to look at that sort of stuff. Um, but they weren't you know, really indicating that they wanted to do that. Uh, there was a political article from Brian Bender again that came out, uh, you know, in May last in yeah in May and and soon after his where lawmakers were expressing this they were saying we are not happy with what they're saying they're not doing what we asked them to do we're going to hold them accountable we want them to do X Y and Z and um, that's when you heard the hearings being announced and you know the the congressional hearing that happened just a few months ago mm -hmm. and their tone was much different in that hearing their tone was we're going to do what you want we're going to look at this historical stuff we are we're going to do everything you're asking us to do so that's what they're saying um there were a couple of concerning things that happened in that hearing though that i think that where they're still i think this is their tactic their tactic has always been a wait and see most of the uh um, motivation to do something about this topic comes from public interest and, and big public interest. Yeah. Um, but that is often not, it often doesn't last long. It lasts as long as a news cycle. Public so I pressure think they're trying too. to, right. I mean, as long as it's in the news, that's when it's, it's going to, they're going to get that pressure. Um, and I think that they were trying to wait it out because, you know, even, in those hearings, they weren't well prepared. They obviously didn't hadn't done much research. Really, the only thing we got out of them is we're going to do this. We're going to do what you're saying. UAPs are serious. UAPs are a big deal. We don't know what they are. We're going to do all this. So that was the good stuff. Otherwise, the stuff that they presented was kind of stupid. Kind of, <laughs> I don't know if that's the best word to use, but it wasn't that great. It was it was silly and it was um, condescending in some cases. So there was a case out there.
that Jeremy Corbell had been um, sharing with the public where he said these were triangular shaped UAP that had been um, kind of invading the this, this ship. Um, they debunked that and said these were drones. These were just drones. You know, this oh, is an really? example of how the public goes crazy with something and then they get it totally wrong. And they were kind of right. It, yes, I was about to say they're kind of right there. Exactly. Kind of. They were kind of right. But then a lot of people were saying, wait a second. Okay, those are drones, but what the hell are a bunch of drones doing then, you know, coming and flying around a, a Navy ship and, uh, you know, willy nilly, and we don't know what they are. And some of the Navy guys think they're UFOs. What's up with that? So, which is, gets back to a little bit of what Chris Mellon was saying is that by ignoring UAP, we are blinding ourselves to things that might not be UAP, that might be Chinese or Russian, but we're blowing it off and we're ignoring it because we think it's UAP. We can't do that, exactly. like this drone situation, because the U.S. is typically focused on cutting edge technology. So what uh, I we've identified lately, um, and I mean that, that the Pentagon has identified, and that's gotten into this conversation, is kind of what's going on in Ukraine. You know, I think it was just today even. There was some cheap drones that they're able to put munitions on, fly those into like a gas tanker and explode it. So you've got this big supply depot on fire, Russian supply depot on fire in the Ukraine. And all they used were these cheap little drones. So, I mean, the drone technology and these cheaper kind of guerrilla warfare kind of tactics that you can do with low level electronics now is the type of thing we have a blind spot for that now is getting kind of more full. And it was really kind of this conversation that um, helped do that to say, look, UAP are, are sometimes things that you guys are ignoring that are important that we need to pay attention to. And you, the Ukraine is kind of putting an exclamation mark on that. So there was that aspect of things, certainly. Um, but the other thing they did was show a UFO video. And it was ridiculous. It was, you know, this little small round thing that goes through the screen so quickly that it's only in a frame or two. Um, also, you know, there's this whole ridiculous part of the hearing where they're trying to get them to freeze a frame on that object because no one had thought of maybe I should get a screenshot of that object to show people. So they spent, I don't know, five, 10 minutes in this real awkwardness where they're trying to go back and forth on the video to, to freeze on it. Um, but their point was, this is the type of data we're dealing with. And that was completely disingenuous because certainly they get crappy UFO videos. We all see crappy UFO videos, but we know for a fact, and they have admitted that they have very good UFO videos. Congress mm -hmm. people, others have said they've seen some of those videos. Uh, just recently, John Greenwald uh, had discovered that they claim they have 22 of these sorts of videos that they're not sharing, they're classified. So they could have shown something better than this. I mean, that little thing was still kind of speaking to the skeptics in the bunker saying, you know, there's still reason for you guys to be skeptical on this topic, especially when this is the kind of crap videos we deal with. What they should have been mentioning were cases like Nimitz, where you have video, you have radar data, you have eyewitnesses, uh, several highly trained, you know, pilot high witnesses, including the uh, the commander of, of that wing, you know, the fighter jet wing who right, yeah. chased the Tic Tac object. So so there was still a little indication to show that maybe the DOD isn't completely on board. But I think there's a lot of com conversations around secrecy that aren't being addressed that that would make it difficult for the DOD to tackle this topic also. So in the past, we've heard that um, whatever the UAP uh, research groups do is classified. Uh, we have no intention of sharing what cases we're looking at, where, who, what, when, why, or anything. We are not have no intentions to share ever, anything. And even when Chris Mellon was suggesting that the Congress pursue this issue, he said, I realize that it's probably going to have to be in a classified setting. Um, fortunately, Congress said, no, we want some public information as well. Um, so that's what they've been advocating for. And supposedly we're supposed to get a second report this month that oh, really? okay. shares some information with the public. I, so um, we'll get a better idea when or if that report comes out. But uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm going to say you answered my next question. It was the, why there have been so many governmental uh, UFO organizations lately. And can you talk about some of these ones? We've got some notes here in front of us, Alejandro. Yeah. Talk a little bit about some of those. Uh, we have the uh, Unidentified Aerial uh, Phenomena Task Force, uh, UAPTF. Yeah. We have AIMSOG. We have Arrow. Yep. We talked about that yeah. before we hit the record button here, but can you kind of outline yeah. some of those? So I've already kind of outlined a couple, the first couple of groups, which are a couple of the acronyms, because we're all, of course, these are, this is the alphabet soup. So we went from OSAP to ATIP, the paranormal kind of investigation to the UFO, military UFO investigation. Um, everything got blown, you know, everything got exposed in mm -hmm. 2017, New York Times. Interesting enough, Lou's buddies were gone. Like Lou was not alone when he was coming out. He had a lot of friends who were investigating, doing research. And, you know, he was expecting that they would kind of come out and help him and try to help push this. But they were kind of freaked out. They stayed in the background. So we didn't hear much from the government until the Navy said, we're going to take this seriously. Soon after that, it was announced that uh, Naval Intelligence was starting a, a group called the UAP Task Force. Uh, Lou Elizondo told us this is just a continuation of ATIP. The DOD press said, uh, um, you know, press people said, no, that's not true. But the US DOD press people have been wrong a lot. I mean, they've been giving a lot of misinformation about all of this stuff uh, as it's gone along, especially regarding to Lou Elizondo. Uh, but it turns out Lou was right because the guy who headed up uh, the UAP task force, uh, Stratton, Jay Stratton, he was part of OSAP also. So it was a continuation and he's confirmed that. Um, and so supposedly a lot was going on at that time, them creating relationships with departments you know, because the first thing they've got to do is go find out what information everybody has. so They can gather it, have people share that information with them so they can analyze it. But then the DOD kind of changed course and said they were going to shut down the UAP task force and create a new group um, under like the defense secretary or the, the um, undersecretary of defense intelligence. And... Um, which was a little bit concerning because that's where Lou had come from. And he felt that, you know, they weren't open to really taking the topic seriously. Um, also, you know, this is when this new group was talking about just looking at information, just starting to gather information that they would look into, which of course, like we had reviewed, that's not what the Congress wanted. They wanted something right. bigger and better. So then we had the hearings where DOD finally got the message. We want something bitter and better, bigger and better. Oh, by the way, that group that I'm talking about was called the AIOMSG. Um, and then in the hearings, they actually used a different acronym, AIMSOG, AIMSOG. AIMSOG. Um, and actually, I, I, I could go look them up and read to you what those mean, but it doesn't even matter well, anymore I've because got now right they're gone. Yeah. Okay. Airborne Object Identification and Management Synchronization Group. Whew. You know, I, I can't <laughs> yeah, remember. Yeah, that's that. a mouthful. It's in front of me. <laughs> but now it's changed because after, during the hearings and they're like, look, we're going to do everything you want us to do. Um, then it was announced soon after the hearings in, in July that we're going to create a new group. We got a new group now that is going to do this and they're called their acronym is ARO, A A R O. They're the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. So um, that's the new organization. We've heard that uh, it's being ran by, uh, I think his name is Sean Kirkpatrick, who is supposedly a physicist, or at least he has a degree um, in physics and he's more science oriented, although he is a policy guy, from what I understand which isn't a bad thing. He just knows how to get things done. He's an administrator. Right. So um, they're just started. Uh, I think that I've heard that they've had a couple hires thus far. Um, no, so got, the question is, are they going to have this report come out? Yeah, what month? I've got we'll here see. in front of me is that this is uh, Arrow started in August. That's how new? Uh, well, they were announced in july okay but 
Yeah, in August, I think is when they probably just got rolling. And now they they look into sea, air, and space. I mean, they're the uh, the yeah. what we would call uh, unidentified submerged objects, unidentified yeah. flying objects, and then in space. That's what's really cool. So uh, Aero is still under the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security. Um, but, uh, you know, which is where Lou was also. But to your point, one of the great things is, and this is a congressional thing, because Congress has been listening to like Chris Mellon and these these former mm -hmm. these UAPTF guys and everything. And Elizondo and others. So they're kind of more up to speed. So at the SCU, you know, the term we've we've used the term UAP for for years. Um, we've always used that term because that's what science likes. Um, UAP had initially was unidentified aerial phenomena. However, at SEU, we use the term unidentified aerospace phenomena to include more than just things flying in the air. However, they've taken that even further and wisely so. And I think this is great because they also are interested in USOs. You know, unidentified submerged objects, submerged which have objects, been yes. we've called for years. You know that those of us UFO researchers have been into that topic for a long time, and and in the Nimitz situation, they felt they had something like that going on when the object that they chased was above something that was in the water. So there could have been a larger object under the water. Either way, um, apparently, it sounds like they're hearing from the Navy about USOs. In fact, during the hearings. One of the Congress people said, what about USOs, underwater uh, objects? And they said, we'll take that. We'll tell you about that in the um, classified section. Exactly. So they took that totally offline. But Congress has been using the verbiage UAP to stand for now. And this is new in the last couple of months. Unidentified aerial and submerged objects. So oh. now it's all encompassing. And I, I really like that terminology because... Yeah, it encompasses all of that phenomena because not only if something can go what they call transmedium, so it can go from right. the air into the water, um, like the Aguadilla case that we investigated with the SCU, um, Aguadilla, Puerto UFO. Rico. Yeah, they saw this object go under the water and out with not with no loss of speed. We don't know any type of propulsion that can do that currently that that we have. So that sort of thing is important. Another thing that um, transmedium issue that's really important that Chris Mellon has brought up is what about space? He asked the question, you know, have you guys tracked these things coming in or out of space? And he has not gotten an answer. They've all kind of nobody's answered that question. Um, because if we've caught something on satellite that can go from the air into space or back and forth, that's obviously very significant because we right. we have rockets that'll do that. But, you know, there's very few, few types of propulsion that we uh, use that are able to do that. Um, let me, speaking of space, do you think, is NASA getting involved in this? To your they knowledge? are. Yes, that NASA has announced that they are going to start a group. They've assigned a couple scientists to it who are doing uh, research right now. I know they're, reach, they're reaching out to scientific UAP uh, research organizations and asking questions. And I think right now they're just trying to get a lay of the land. You know, they're trying to fight who are the scientists that are interested in doing work on this topic? What are their thoughts? Um, and then taking that information, what can we do as NASA? Um, and that's where they are. So their current project is um, still going to last a few more months, uh, but that's what they're doing is information gathering right now with the intent, though, to start a project here uh, probably early next year. So you've been pretty close to a lot of this going on mm -hmm. recently. And I say recently, I mean the last four or five years. Um, yeah. Seriously, what do you think they will be sharing with the general public? Where do you think they'll draw the line? Well, that's, that's a great question. And that's why I feel um, not to have your expectations too high when it comes to the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. um, 
they're obviously very secretive already, but I think there is a lot of, <laughs> I at one point called them Eliz invisible elephants, elephants with yeah. cloaking devices on in the room. Uh, and what I mean by that is that the, the military has talked about the need for secrecy and how they mm -hmm. can't share much information, but they haven't explained why. Why do you need secrecy around UFOs? So what happens with a lot of the public is they think, well, obviously they don't want to tell us aliens are here. But there's a, it's much more complicated than that. One of the things that they announced recently is that their definition of UAP means that they will not look at man-made objects. So everybody thought, oh, they're, they're admitting that they're from space or they're not human-made. Not necessarily. What they're saying is if they are human-made, uh, that's not a UAP which obviously it's not. Um, and the reason why is that we already have organizations, foreign technology organizations that deal with human made objects, even if they're not identified. If we think it's human technology, we don't know who, whose it is, but we wanna look into it. We send that to groups that already have been existing for decades that examine foreign technology, you know, at Area 51 too, where they're flying around Russian planes and Chinese planes that we've captured or, maybe bought on the black market, who knows how they got that stuff. So that's, we'll, we'll go there. I mean, bottom but line is, is does issue. you, does UFO really mean aliens? I mean, I, you and I have been know. doing this a long time. Yeah. It means unidentified. So we don't exactly. know it's unidentified. We're still looking into it. Um, but here's the problem. If you're working for the military and you've got a UAP case, you don't want to call it, non-human or not Chinese or Russian, unless you're 100% sure, because what if you're wrong? And it turns out we just told the world, hey, we don't know what this is. And it's Chinese technology. What if the Tic Tac is a Chinese? Of course, the Tic Tac, the way it's described, 40 foot, huge, white, traveling around, hovering and then traveling at these ridiculous speeds. Um, that's way beyond our technology, China's or Russian. So that one's a little more safe. But when mm -hmm. it comes down to these cases, I mean, you're going to want to be really careful. There's so many issues. Or let's say that they're working with um, MUFON. And MUFON is gathering data and investigating cases. Uh, and the military is working with them. But then they're like, oh, you know what? That's ours. But they can't, or we know that's Chinese, or we know that's Russian. But they can't tell MUFON, even though MUFON needs to know to have clean data that would be for classified. Us, what we're doing. But yeah, that's classified information. Right. So there's a lot of really sticky situations um, when it comes around the secrecy. And this is why it needs to be secret. Also, disinformation. I think that uh, there have been a couple studies, and we've even seen this, where the military has used UFOs for disinformation. One um, area I can think of that is, uh, and this isn't necessarily disinformation, but where the UFO topic worked in their favor. And that was with the U-2 in the CIA document that um, uncovered, or at least was the first time they used the term Area 51 publicly. Uh, it's actually a document that talks about the history of Area 51. Right. And they talked about how the U-2 caused a lot of UFO sighting reports, and they would let them believe that they were UFOs mostly because the U-2 was flying much higher than any other plane could fly at the time or was supposed to be flying at the time. Um, so pilots would see something up there flying and they would report it as a UFO. Um, and not only did, you know, the people at Area 51 not want to correct people, they loved people thinking they were UFOs because then, you know, it wouldn't notify the Russians that we've got this U-2 flying around, even though Russians were able to shoot one down. But... Um, so that's where it's really sticky. And I think that w it's going to be difficult to rely on a lot of uh, information from the military because it's just such a difficult, sticky situation. That's why my hopes lie in um, groups like NASA or other civilian research organizations like the SCU or right. like what we're doing at Enigma Labs. Do you actually think the government is looking for aliens? I don't know. That's really tough to know because there's a couple of schools of thought on that. Yeah. There's that they know already that these things are alien 
or there's the other that maybe they suspect and they they are you know vigorously trying to find out or that they don't care they're it's ignorant they don't want to know they'd rather bury their sand head in the sand and not deal with it um it's hard to know where they are on that scope and i don't think we have strong evidence to really point to anything except for that there's an abundance of that latter category so there's abundance of ignorance Mm -hmm. um there's no doubt around the topic so those end those people who blow off the topic from the get-go obviously they're not going to care or think that there's anything like aliens um and i don't have there's certainly insiders such as the whole osap group you know all of those group of people that work with bigelow just like bigelow who said on famously on 60 minutes he's like aliens are here i know that they've been here for a long time and you know he, he was asked by the 60 minutes reporter aren't you you know don't you worry that people are going to think that you're kind of crazy or something and he said i can give a damn um you know those guys are all certain that uh, that's going on and they're all government contractors obviously they were government contractors for bigelow but they've also worked on other projects so how put off has been a government project uh, you know a, a, they all hold classifications they're all hold um you know work on classified projects but how put off has been working on government projects his entire career eric davis another scientist that was part of the bigelow group is also currently he works um for the aerospace company um jay stratton uh Mm -hmm. along with uh ting um what's his first name taylor um who is on the skinwalker television show skinwalk yes yeah both of them now are working on classified projects for a defense company in alabama so these are all people that have worked on government contracts and they're certain now are they certain because of their own personal experiences I'm talking about dr travis taylor dr travis taylor exactly right. that's who i'm talking about um they just him and stratton just recently got jobs for a defense corporation out I'm of uh, that are working on energy weapons out of alabama but um tim and and travis is not convinced it's aliens but I think most of the rest of them are. Um, and one piece of evidence where you can find that out, including the DIA guy who ran the OSAP project for the DIA, uh, Likatsky, he recently wrote a book with George Knapp uh, from Las Vegas, a reporter who's close with Bigelow and has been reporting on all this stuff for a long time, and Colm Kelleher, um, Bigelow's right-hand man, Bigelow's um, lead scientist. Uh, they wrote a book with Likatsky um, called Skinwalker at the Pentagon, where they outline all of this. And you, it, they make it very clear that they believe all this phenomena. And this is what I've been trying to tell people, because this is the headline, is that the government spent $22 million on a paranormal project where the contractor who was sent in to research all of this stuff determined, you know, looked at tons of different paranormal topics determined they were all real and the DIA guy in charge of uh, the whole project for the DIA agreed with them. A $22 million paranormal project where the conclusion was that it's all real. Um, so, uh, yeah, I heard that It's a crazy situation. Yeah. I mean, this is where science can actually step forward and help. Yeah. I mean, Bigelow with his National Institute of Discovery Science, I know that's, I don't think that's uh, in play anymore, is it? Nids? No, that, that ended that. in, um, I think, early 2000s before yeah. Bigelow. Uh, and then he started Bigelow Advanced Aerospace, uh, or no, Advanced Space Systems, um, which was yeah, the group that worked with us at. Right, yeah. But um, if we think about it, how, I'm going to ask you this. How do you think science can actually help us in these areas? Yeah, this is what's exciting. Um, And that's where I'm focused. This is where I live is um, I'm not a scientist myself, but of course uh, I'm more of a facilitator administrator. And when it comes to the company I work for the, the UAP expert. Um, So I think science can definitely help. There's a lot, you know, um, at SCU before 2017 and in, um, 
we were a pretty small group. So, you know, you've got a few people doing their best to make some reports, but we came up with some pretty good. Um, but now there are more and more and more and more scientists getting involved. So it's really exciting. Um, and I think that more can be found on a couple fronts. Um, there are theoretical fronts that are really helpful. Um, so theorizing around um, propulsion, uh, you know, and it's different when, you know, a bunch of people do that on Twitter uh, than actual physicists, actual scientists, because they can write papers where it's backed by actual science. Um, so this is real stuff that could happen. The important part of that is then we can kind of speculate, okay, here are the types of propulsions they may be using. What kind of equipment then do we have to develop or can we gather to monitor um, the uh, indicators that would show us they're using this sort of technology? So for instance, um, the rosin bridge or whatever, you know, there's, there's certain types of kind of warp technology that will mm -hmm. emit certain type of radiation. So we can get radiation readers to measure that, to see if when there is a sighting, if we're catching any of that sort of radiation. There's a signature that's left over that they can actually. Exactly. Look at. So, you know, all of that works, makes all of this smarter, where we get more equipment, we theorize uh, to gather more data. The other side of the data factor is working with that data. So at Enigma, you know, we will, we're working on an app um, where we've got a ton of UFO sighting report data from all over the world in there, and we're getting more all the time. So people can go in there and start to do some trend analysis. You know, where are things? Where are triangular UFOs mm -hmm. historically? Where are this type or that type? We're also using machine learning to score these. So instead of like at SEU, we've got to go one at a time. People have to go through every case. Is this a good case? Yes. Is this a good case? No. Um, literally takes years, but what, with our app, we're going to be able to instantly score them. And so you'll be instantly be able to say, I want only cases that are at 10. So you, you'll get a bunch of cases that you know are substantial cases. Um, so then you can trend around that. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's the nature of these? Are they around nuclear, uh, bases or, or, uh, locations? That's one thing that, um, uh, SEU is looking into are they uh what are where what are the characteristics of the different shaped craft um are they around water and the ones that are around water or going in and out of water where is that happening um it's it's enigma labs enigma is the name of the app um yeah we need to talk about that a little bit uh enigma. yeah because so this, this is a software pro an app correct and correct. um let me just back up a mi little minute uh, here, Alejandro. We've seen um, sort of a running forward of the scientific community recently. They're starting to get on board. Why do you think they were so opposed to begin with? Um, a few reasons. One, one is funding. Not that there's definitely funding now, but there's more funding potentially coming from the government uh, and NASA. But the taboo um, is huge for scientists. With scientists, your credibility is very, very important. It's everything. Mm -hmm. um, and if you risk your reputation, you're risking your work. Um, and so that's why scientists are the most shy uh, around this topic. And even with the SCU, a lot of the scientists we have don't use their real name because they don't want their name to get out there publicly. Um, in fact, you know, uh, you know, you probably know Diana Pasolka. Uh, yeah. I asked her, you know, as a with your students, what do you tell them about getting into this topic? Um, you know, is it dangerous for their careers? And she said, oh, yeah. I tell my students, don't touch anything weird until you're tenured. So, I mean, that's how it uh, gives you an idea of just how uh, getting associated with a topic like this can can really have a negative effect on a, your career as a scientist. But that's loosening up. 
Not, yeah, I, mean, this, I would this... say universally yet, but in pockets right. where there are now more organizations and universities kind of like Kevin Knuth is part of SU, Dr. Kevin Knuth. He's excellent. He works out of Albany. One of his colleagues, Matthew Zydegas, also um, both of them were kind of in the uh, astrophysics kind of arena. Their university has been okay with it. Of course, I think uh, they're both tenured, right? Like, I'm pretty sure I know Knuth is, but um you know, so there are some institutions that are now starting to be like, it's OK for you guys to do that, whereas yeah. we didn't have that in the past. Well, I think this this rolls across the full spectrum of academia because we're talking about archaeology, anthropology, geology. Yes. I mean, even in, into the more uh, the, the psychology and, and things like that uh, used to be a killer for your career. Uh, but I think that's slowly turning around, don't you think? I think it's definitely turning around. Uh, it's the slowest area for that turnaround to happen, but it's definitely happening. Yeah. Um, and that's exciting because that's what's really opening these doors. And and I think are going to open the doors to discovery um, in this topic. I think eventually, you know, academia will start to spend more money. We've seen a little bit of it. Uh, we've seen a couple of... Um, UAP uh, um, grants popping up here and there for students mm -hmm. to do like papers on UAP or even their, um, um, yeah, to, to do work on that. So that's really exciting. Um, and I think we're going to see more of that. And uh, the science that's getting done out there right now, it, it's, it's still slow, but it's much quicker than it was. And I think it's great. And I think that we're going to make a lot of discoveries. I mean, I am so confident. I'm, you know, uh, when it comes to creating a an app uh, or a database that can be um, researched and analyzed uh, tools to do that mm -hmm. sort of thing, to look at cases, everybody's been wanting to do that. Blue Book wanted to do it. Of course, technology wasn't necessarily there. Bigelow and their group have wanted to do it. TTSA has wanted to do it. Everybody's been wanting to do this, but nobody's gotten there yet. And I think we're going to be first uh, ones to get there. And we're working very, very closely at Enigma Labs with the scientific research community. Um, uh, we've got a great relationship with many of them. So, um, and they're really backing us and, and helping because they they want these tools. These are the tools so, that a lot of scientists have been act, asking for for a long time. So I'm really excited about what we're going to discover when we start to look at uh, these cases and these. So trends. you guys are reaching out to all the all the all the various disciplines of science with this project yeah and you know what you've got a great uh point there too with the different disciplines a couple points on that one i think it's one of the problems that nids and bigelow ran into that they have a limited amount of scientists um and so a lot of the times they're researching things that are out of their wheelhouse they don't really have an expert on let's say metallurgy mm -hmm. or chemistry um and they're looking at these things when they don't really have experts uh, in those arenas. Um, you know, Eric Davis is also, uh, who I mentioned earlier, who works with Bigelow and has worked on a lot of Black projects. He says this is kind of um, inherent in Black projects as well, one of the problems, because you have a limited amount of scientists that are read into the project. And let's say he's working with some process and he can't figure out how to make it work, but he knows a guy at University of whatsoever who's right. an expert on this, well, it'll take months, if not longer, to even talk to that guy about this because that guy's got to get a clearance. Um, then he's got to get read into the project. All of this is super expensive um, and takes a lot of time. So it's really hard to do good science in black projects. Right. Um, and, and so that's one reason he says, you know, he's of the belief and he has briefed Congress people on this. He believes that there have been crashes like Roswell was real and that we just couldn't make heads or tails of, of the craft in these black projects. One of the reasons, because there's so few scientists that can even get involved. And so these objects have just been locked up in a um, Indiana Jones type warehouse. Uh, and hopefully we can go revisit those once we have a better understanding of the science. That's what Eric Davis believes. But that's an example 
of how even he is kind of basing that belief off of how, you know, your point where you need a lot of scientists from different disciplines. Um, they to have be to be willing to step forward and work with you. Yeah. Um, hey, look, um, going forward from this point, there's a good question here that uh, what do you think in congressional hearings are going to reveal in the future? Do you think they're going to be more forthcoming, more transparent uh, as time goes, Alejandro? No, I think these reports um, are not going to have a lot of information. I think it's really hard for them to share share information in the intelligence arena. Um, I think it's it's and it's hard because as much as I want to know, I also feel for them and their plight because it's hard to share that sort of information. And you probably want to err on the side of secrecy because. You know, we're dealing with important stuff here with Russian and Chinese, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, counterintelligence and everything. Right. Yeah. They're really sensitive topics. So I'm not do you, sure. Do you think that that panic, uh, op, uh, that panic button is still out there with this? Or do you think that people would them? panic if they found yeah. out more? I don't know about that. I don't think so. I'm not so sure that was even ever proven. I think it will all depend on how much it affects people's lives. Um, and right now, UFOs, aliens are not affecting people's lives whatsoever. So if there was some kind of announcement that, yeah, we think they are aliens, but they're kind of flying around at 20,000 feet or higher, mm -hmm. uh, these little probes, and whenever we get close to them, they run away. So they're not much to worry about. I don't think people would be surprised or really care that much. Yeah. I mean, the it'd be exciting the, and fun, but um, the proof is, is that there are still unidentified objects in our, in our skies, in our oceans. We don't know what they are. We don't know where they came yeah. from. We don't know who's, so there's still a lot of speculation. Um, and we're, we're about out of time here. Just a real quick question. I don't want this to be a trick question, but you're familiar with what's going on at Skinwalker, Skinwalker Ranch. How do you think all of this research up there fits into what we've been talking about? Um, how does it fit in? I guess my answer, my knee jerk would be it doesn't because unfortunately they say they weren't able to do real science because they felt whatever it was, was uh, one step ahead of them and kept them from really capturing anything substantial. So we don't have much data. We mostly have yet again, anecdotal information for this stuff. Um, it appears on the television show that they're getting lots of weird stuff that is potentially physical evidence. We'll see because we haven't really been able to analyze that information yet. And it's difficult. You can't do science on a TV show, but you can do some fun stuff, uh, experiments like they've been doing. Um, so we'll have to see. I think that's yet to be foreseen. But I... I would like to talk about the UFO Congress before we're out of time. Let's do real quick. We're, we've, just, we've got a couple of minutes left. Okay. So yeah, there you go. The International UFO Congress coming up next week. So it's the 12th to the 16th um, here in Mesa, Arizona. Um, should be a ton of fun as usual. We've got a lot of great speakers. We've got Brian Bender, who I keep talking about. We're going to have a couple movies that will be, uh, one will be premiered. One is James Fox's latest movie on the Virginia oh, yeah. uh, event where uh, allegedly, you know, some, some firemen, kind of captured this alien, essentially. Um, the aerial phenomena, we're going to have the director of that, uh, Randy Nickerson, and he's going to be sharing that movie. If you haven't seen it, it's an excellent movie. It is so, so good. Um, but we're going to have Stacy Wright, head of Phoenix MUFON. She's going to be talking about uh, the Phoenix Lights. Uh, that's her kind of first time doing a talk solo like that. So that'll be fun. Um, we have Travis Walton, as usual, uh, who I mentioned uh, well, I didn't mention that. I was telling you guys, but I got to take Travis Walton with me when I took the Kardashians to Area 51. But you're going to have right. to wait till come to the conference if you want to hear more about that story. Um, it, who else? It, I don't know. We got it, Bryce Zabel. Yeah, Bryce is going to be there. You got uh, David Marler. Katie um, Grabowski or Katie Page, Katie, Katie Page from Colorado. Been, yeah. yeah. Uh, Patricia, can you pop up uh, Alejandro's uh, websites real quick? Yeah, there yeah, we go. There. So there's the app, Enigma Labs. Second one is SCU. 
And the last one is openminds.tv. So that was a website I ran for many years where we covered UFO news. It's still up. Uh, and I, I did find a couple magazine articles that I put up, one on Billy Meyer and one on Carl Jung and his and UFO interests. Yeah, you've got some very good stuff uh, still up there on Open Minds yeah. TV. Lots yeah. of great articles up there. We have lots of great writers. Antonio Guneas, uh, yeah. Jason McClellan, um, really good stuff. So, yeah, we are out of time. There is Enigma. Um, check that out, folks. We're out of time. Alejandro, I want to thank you again for joining us. Uh, it's been it, it, it's the quickest hour in the day. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Flies by. You know? So, everyone, um, we will also have this program up on YouTube. And when you get to YouTube, please uh, click on the like and certainly subscribe to us so we can continue with KGRA bringing all these kind of great programs and wonderful guys like, and I'd have to say a, a friend of mine besides a, a, an associate and a, and a colleague, uh, Alejandro Rose, Rojas. I've known you for 15 or 20 years, Alejandro, and it's it's just been a heck of a ride, hasn't it? We've yeah. seen a lot happen. And it's so everyone, on, uh, yeah, on behalf of Alejandro and, um, and uh, my program manager, who is behind the scenes, uh, Patricia Wilkinson, I'm your host here on Dark Window. And join us again next week for another amazing guest right here on KGRA's digital broadcast, Dark Window. Thank you and good night, everyone. <laughs>